Hi, Stuart Gorski here, Staff One for the Gardena Disaster Communication Service. I am here at the, what is this fair? This is the second annual Palos Verdes Peninsula Disaster Preparedness Fair. And uh, I'm with uh, Diana Feinberg, Staff 60 for the Los Angeles County Disaster Communication Service for LA County. You are also the head of uh, the Lomita Sheriff Station DCS group. So, okay, so Diana, what are you doing here at this fair today? Today we're trying to make people aware of uh, the disaster preparedness resources that might help them weather any kind of calamity. Uh, in this particular area, we're trying to promote amateur radio in particular because this will help a number of people provide communication when other forms of communication are out. So here at our immediate exhibit, this is the exhibit for the LA County Disaster Communication Service. The next table over is for the Palos Verdes Amateur Radio Club. The table beyond them is for the City of Rancho Palos Verdes uh, Disaster Amateur Radio Group. And finally, at the very end of this row is the City of Rancho Palos Verdes Emergency Preparedness Committee, which was one of the orchestrators of this event. So you have a bunch of really nifty radios here. Uh, what are you representing with these radios? Okay, well these radios are just uh, on display right now, but these radios represent what um, volunteers in disaster communication can work with. These are examples of handheld radios covering various frequency bands, and these are examples of mobile radios one could either put in a car or keep uh, on a desktop or a shelf somewhere. Right now these batteries are running off of a heavy-duty battery shown behind the uh, counter here and uh, we can actually transmit through this antenna that's here. So the key point is that radios like these all operate at about 13.8 volts. It's about the same voltage as would be in a car. So these work very well in a car. So um you work out of Los Angeles County, the Lumita Sheriff Station. Uh, you've got big antennas and you can transmit pretty far. So organizations like ours, the Gardena Disaster Communication Service, uh, in when the city of Gardena, if there's a major event and we need uh, help from the county, our process is to report back to you and then you contact the county for us. That is the procedure, right? Correct, however, the cities are able to get into the county EOC directly. If they cannot do it, then they can go through alternate channels such as through our Lameda Station uh, approach. Okay. Every, so now, every city does have a handheld radio called C-Wires, C-W-I-R-S, that is linked to the county. Mm -hmm. uh, and if a city cannot use that to reach the county EOC, cities are free to use other modes like ham radio, like Gardena, DCS, and other means to get into a sheriff station and through that reach the county EOC. Okay, now you have individual team members and uh, do you ever send them out uh, around the city or around the area? Do you ever send them out? And if so, what kind of, uh, what do they do? What do they report? Okay, people are only sent out when activated and authorized, and that's because of the way the California Disaster uh, Volunteer Insurance Program works. So when authorized and activated, uh, our people will go where the Sheriff's Department directs them in the field and they'll report in via their handheld radios or mobile radios in their car what the conditions are or whatever traffic needs to be communicated into the sheriff's station. So are you looking for new members? Absolutely. Uh, DCS, the LA County DCS, has been greatly revamped in uh, recent years. It's not what it used to be. Um, many people may have other memories of it, but we've made great efforts to invest in training and other programs and areas of involvement, including helping maintain the Sheriff's Department's own radio systems for those who have that kind of technical knowledge. So really, it's, it's a great opportunity for anyone who really gets to deeply into disaster radio communication. So if someone were to want to join the service, first they need to have their ham radio license? That is correct. And if they have their ham radio license and they want to help out the county, where would they go to join? Okay, they would need to go to the LA County uh, DCS website, which is lacdcs.org, 
or they can get on to the Lamita Sheriff Station DCS website, which is www.qsl.net stroke LMTDCS. And there's a link there called Join Us, and we'll get back to you with more information. Thank you, Diana. So Diana Feinberg, Staff 60 for the Los Angeles County Disaster Communication Service. Hi, I'm with uh, two members of the Palos Verdes Amateur Radio Club. Your name, sir? Clay. Clay, well, your last name, Clay? Davis. And your call sign? AB9A. And, and you are? Yeah, I'm Ray, Ray Day, and I'm N6HE. So you guys represent the Palos Verdes Amateur Radio Club? That's correct. Okay, yeah. and you do a lot of uh, disaster communications, correct? We practice disaster communications. Oh, okay, so what is it? Yeah. So you're in Palos Verdes, so you support Palos Verdes, uh, the EOC, or what, what do you guys do? Yeah, well, we are uh, the Palos Verdes Amateur Radio Club, which is the hobby side of everything, but many of our members are members of NART and PVAN for the uh, RPV, as well as DCS. So this is the hobby side, if you will, and many of our members support the disaster communications portion. So you guys, do you uh, have a seat in the local EOC? Well, yeah, I'm a member of NART, the Neighborhood Amateur Radio Team for the mm -hmm. Palos Verdes Estates. Mm -hmm. And we have an EOC and a disaster response organization. So yes, I sometimes sit at the seat of the EOC. So how did you guys get in with the city? Because sometimes uh, it's hard to get in with the city and they have to accept you, they have to get to know you. How did that come about? You know, I really don't know. By the time I got there, we were already a going concern, so here we are. So how many members do you have? The Palos Verdes Amateur Radio Club has about 140 members. And do you run disaster drills? Did you guys work the shakeout? N no, not as the Amateur Radio Club. Mm -hmm. You know, the PVAN people over here, they did that, yes. Okay, so what kind of radio uh, capabilities do you guys have? Well, we have handheld capability like this uh, Yesu FT60. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals carry. We also have base station radios. What varies. frequencies do you guys use? Uh, well, we're two meters and 70 centimeters. Both. And when you're doing emergency communications with the city, are you on the two meter band or the UHF band? We use both. Use both. D okay. Depending on where you are in the city and what function you're performing. Very good. So, um, have you had any call outs to help the city for any reason? Personally, I, I have not, no. But, have you know, excuse me, one of the things that you may also be interested in yes. um, is that all of this is generally local yes. with uh, line of sight type communications. Yes, sir. The radio amateurs in their homes also have communications across the state and across the country. So they're using HF? We do use HF. Okay. If and hope, hopefully we'll never need to do that. But what saved Alaska in 1964 for a week, the only communications in and out of Alaska was amateur radio. Very good. So if uh, members in the area want to join your club, how do they do that? Oh, well, you can go to the website for NART if you, if you uh, Google. Uh, Palos Verdes Estates Neighborhood Amateur Radio Team, you'll come up with a website and it'll give you a means to get an application and to fill it out and to mail it in to the city and you'll be contacted. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you fellas, thank you for your service. Okay. Uh -huh. Hi there, I'm with members of the uh, NART organization and you are? I'm Matt. And w your call sign? WA6AJC. And you are? I'm Bob, AB6SY. And? I'm Blake, KI6YME. And NART, what is NART? NART stands for Neighborhood Amateur Radio Team. We're the disaster communications uh, group for the city of Palos Verdes Estates. We're seconded to the police department and are responsible for handling intra-city communications in case of a disaster. So if there's a disaster, what will your organization do? You're going to be in the EOC? Well, we will be wherever we can be conveniently placed. No one really knows where they're going to be in a disaster, so it's kind of get on the radio, find out what's going on, contact the net control, and go from there. So if there's a disaster, they may deploy you somewhere in the area, correct? That's correct. And what would you be reporting? I would be reporting what they want me to report. Uh, we're trying to set up communications for uh, disaster uh, um, emergency uh, vehicles and things like that. Uh, first responders trying to contact uh, acts as a communication between them. 
So what kind of equipment do you have? What kind of frequencies are you using? Well, we use the ham radio frequencies. We use UHF and VHF. We use 2 meter and 440. Um, and these are frequencies that anyone can use as long as you have uh, an uh, amateur radio um, technician license. So it's the first license you get. And these, uh, we have radios equipped with both frequencies, and we try to be frequency agile in, uh, in our communications because sometimes uh, there might be, you know, jamming or scattering or uh, interference, and we'd like to be able to easily move from one frequency to another to get all the communications done. Now, do you, you run weekly nets? Yes, that's correct. How do you, how do you practice? Well, they just uh, call on the net, and they call each individual uh, person on the net, and they respond and tell how much, uh, how much they've done for the uh, organization in the past week. And we keep track of the numbers and so forth. And we then present them to the police department. So in an emergency, how are you guys activated? Well, we need uh, a city official to declare an activation. So this would be the mayor or someone uh, seconded to the mayor uh, who would declare an activation. Now, we also have permission to self-activate uh, at local facilities. That's not to activate the, the whole disaster effort, but just the radio communication so that if an activation is declared by the mayor, our people are already on site. And we have six sites around the city that people report to, uh, and they're already pre-assigned. Uh, if they aren't available, though, we have the ability to, over the air, reassign people to different locations depending on where we need them. I mean, obviously, people are going to be on vacation or uh, need to take care of family or personal issues. Uh, so we just have to be able to roll with the flow. Very good. So how would a, um, a person join your organization? Well, they would come to uh, an affair like this, or they could check us out on the city website and contact the necessary uh, official, that would be Bob here, who's NART01, and they could provide, or he could provide whatever information they need to fill out and send back to us. Very good. What's your website? www.palacevertes.net stroke NART, N-A-R-T. In it, fact, if you search NART, you'll find it. Is there an email address they can use to contact you? Uh, all that information is there. You can contact me at ab6sy, that's my call, ab6sy at me, M-E, dot com. And there we have it, NART. I'm here with Merlin, that's and it. you are from? We're from Palos Verdes Estates. And you represent which organization is this? This is the Neighborhood Watch for Palos Verdes Estates. And we, we are trying to get as many people involved. We just be aware, be prepared, be safe. That's our motto. We're trying to get people to just take a little moment to make sure they uh, use our value, invaluable checklist of things that we can do to be prepared and be safe. And one of the main things is that we want people to just take, a, take the time to just stop from their daily work and just be involved, talk to their neighbors, talk to how they can, uh, how they can work together. Because when there happens to be a disaster, we're all going to have to work together. We're all in the same boat. <laughs> so uh, you just have like one meeting in the area once a month, or what do you guys do? We, we have uh, one meeting for all the neighborhood watch coordinators, and then each of the coordinators have captains on each of the blocks, and then they have uh, individual meetings. And then we have a national night out, of course, in, in August, where, we're, where we all work together for that. Now, in your individual meetings, do you have city officials or organizations? Absolutely. Uh, LA County Fire or, for instance, the, the water people, do they come and speak? Yes, we are very involved with the police at Palos Verdes Estates. So we try to get the city officials to come, the, uh, the uh, police to come out, uh, as well as the fire people. And also, there's also every, uh, every area has a disaster preparedness person who is, uh, who is involved, so the DDP. Now, uh, I'm with the emergency communications uh, organizations, Wonderful. so do you have a communications plan? 
We do, and that's one of the that that's what the DDP person is involved with. So they're the ones uh, who who coordinate all of that. And he's not right here, but yes. <laughs> so. Um, in an emergency, uh, do certain members have two-way handheld radios? Yes. And uh, do they? Do you know? Are they on FRS or GMRS? I or? don't. Okay. I apologize. So who do they? Commu they obviously maybe communicate with each other. With each other. And do they communicate back to the city? Back to the city, and then also back to us as uh, the coordinators for the the neighborhood watch area. So how many members do you think you have? Yikes! I do not know that. How do people? Twenty-eight hundred. Wow. How do people? <laughs> so how how do people find you? Do you have a website or? We do have a website, and then we each we're we're really involved with each of the uh, captains and the area coordinators. So we have emails that we keep in touch with. We have a website. We do, what have, is the website? Do you know uh, the p p v e n w dot org p v e n w for neighborhood watch dot org. Okay, so they can uh, send an email and get more information. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you for your service. Sir, thank you so much. I'm with Laura Walters from LA County Fire. Hi, Laura. Hi, Stuart. Good to see you. So, uh, I actually saw Laura yesterday where she was teaching a uh, CERT training class in the city of Gardena at the Gardena bus terminal, and she was quite busy. Uh, it was a great class, and I recommend you take the CERT classes. So, where are we today? We are at the Norris Pavilion in Rolling Hills Estates for a Disaster Preparedness Expo. And so what is your role at this expo? Uh, the fire department, LA County Fire, has uh, several displays here. Our uh, forestry unit is here explaining because we do have a lot of uh, urban interface on the peninsula. So there are a lot of brush areas, so our forestry division is explaining to people how to do proper brush clearance and also evacuations during brush fires, which is very important. Now, you know, we're coming into the rainy season as much as we have one. Is there anything that we should know about being prepared for maybe there might be some... Uh, I don't know if we have flooding, but uh, up here, especially in PV, they might have some rain. Is, is there anything we should know? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have a saying, and it is national, of turn around, don't drown. So if you enter an area, like let's say an intersection that is flooded and you cannot see the actual street pavement and you're driving, you need to turn around and not drive through it. Or if there are signs posted in the middle of the street to turn around, do not ignore those. Uh, you do need to turn around because you don't know what has happened and how deep the water is. Okay. Um, you know, I don't think it's too early. It's the holiday season coming up. So do you have any tips about being safe uh, with fires and trees and stuff like that? Yes. Actually, with the holidays, there are a lot of traditions and people use candles. And candles, there are so many now that are battery operated. We really encourage people to use the battery operated uh, flame. That any open flame can catch fire with curtains. They can tip over if people have pets. Pets have been known to knock those over. Um, also with Christmas trees, definitely get rid of them as soon as they're dry after Christmas, and um, and then and just get them in the trash immediately. We do have a lot of house fires each year that really do a lot of destruction to homes because the trees were kept too long and the Christmas lights can okay. end up catching them on fire. Um, I noticed this, uh, there's, you have some kind of app for people who can contact you or what is this about? Absolutely, it's called Pul Pulse Point mm -hmm. and it is an app people can get for free on their phone and if they know CPR, uh, the full CPR or if they know hands only CPR, uh, they can sign up on the app and they will get a notification anytime there's anybody in there, uh, like within a few blocks, that needs CPR. So if a 911 call goes into us and as we are sending paramedics to that incident, then they can get the uh, notification on their phone as well. And then they can, in the meantime, before paramedics get there, they can intervene and actually help with CPR prior to our arrival. Okay, I want to get back to one or two things and I'll let you go. Yes. Why should we, the individual, be taking the search training? 
what does it do? Does it help LA County Fire if we're CERT trained? I mean, it can help us, of course, but why should the regular a person take CERT training? Sure, uh, CERT training actually uh, is emergency preparedness for not only the individual, so it does help you as an individual, but it also then you can prepare your family and your recovery from a disaster is going to be much better. And then once you help yourself and your family, then you can also reach out, help your neighbors. And that is an immense help to both uh, the fire department, to the police department, to your local city government. It, um, because our resources will be spread very thin in the event of a large earthquake. So kind of what you're saying is if I'm CERT trained or the next person is CERT trained, if we can take care of ourselves, that leaves you available to help somebody else who, who, who you know, who needs help. Absolutely. So it makes it a lot easier on you guys. Definitely. Excellent. Okay, so how do we contact you about taking CERT training classes? You can go onto our website at fire.lacounty.gov and we have all of our CERT classes listed there. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Steve. I'm with the Girl Scouts in Palos Verdes Estates, and I am with Carol Holmes, leader of Troop 12345. And you are? Juliana Ramirez. And? Ava Holmes. Sarah Reeves. And we are here at the Disaster Prep Fair. Could you tell us, uh, are you a response organization, or do you prepare people ahead of time? How do the Girl Scouts help for disaster preparedness? Girl Scouts are not a response organization. What we are doing here today is we are talking about how to prepare food and the different kinds of foods you can eat in a disaster or an emergency. So we're educating the public and we're trying to get them to prepare themselves ahead of time to be ready for an emergency when it does happen. Very good. Now, do you talk with kids your own age about disaster preparedness? I personally think it's important for kids of all ages to know about how to um, prepare for disasters because it affects all of us. So whether it's at schools, at you know Girl Scout organizations, or just people who just have questions in general, I think it's important to have an open discussion about it. So um, at school, you hold any kind of events? Do you ever have any booths or anything, or do you train the kids? Not at school, but Girl Scouts has a lot of amazing opportunities that we have um, so we can actually go out to the public and share um, what knowledge that we've um, accumulated. Very good. Now, do you guys have like a website or how do girls join your group? Mm -hmm. well, you want to answer? Yeah, how do they sure. join? We, um, we do have a website, but it's a private website only for our girls. Um, you can contact one of our leaders. I can give you a number mm -hmm. um, to contact and um, then they come in and um, we take girls from 6th through 12th grade. We have 140 girls and 6 leaders. It's a very large troop, but every girl in our troop actually wants to be part of the troop, and they want to be Girl Scouts, and they want to learn about things like this. You are good. Okay, well, thank you, girls, for supporting uh, the community, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Hi there. I am with... Mark Aubin. And we are in what trailer? This is the uh, Department of Homeland Security Investigations Mobile Command Center. And it sounds fancy, but what is this, what do we do here? Uh, basically, what we do is we facilitate communications. Um, we are also a command post for uh, emergency management. And uh, we just, uh, we can facilitate a lot of interoperability with the other agencies as far as uh, radios go. So when would you be deployed? For what kind of uh, circumstance? We get deployed quite often with our SWAT team. We get deployed with um, when we do multi-agency arrest warrants, um, and then also during uh, events such as like the San Bernardino shooting. Okay. Now um, I come from a citizen-based disaster communications uh, world. So how do you or do you even interface with us uh, with ham radio disaster communications citizen-based organization? Do you inter do you work with them at all? We have not worked with them yet, but if there was ever a situation when there is a uh, natural disaster, that was one of our primary go-tos would be the local hams. Okay, so you have lots of very nice equipment here. We can't afford it ourselves, but um, what kind of capabilities? Do you have HF? Uh, we do have we, HF. And can you actually, could you get on the ham bands? Yes, we can. Okay, now you've got UHF, VHF, probably microwave, all kinds of really cool stuff. We don't stuff. have microwave, but we have UHF, VHF. Um, UHF-2, 800, 700, 
um, satellite, and uh, yeah, pretty much anything we. So are, are these are some of the radios uh, field tunable? In other words, if you went into the city of Gardena, where we're from, and we had our uh, organization, could you program a radio on the fly to talk to our organization, which is actually in the Gardena EOC? I actually have Gardena's uh, police radio. Okay, well, very good. So we could patch it right into ours. Um, but yes, we can. I, I have a code plug. I can just go in there, uh, adjust, put the frequencies in and the PLs, and, and if it's encrypted, just as long as I have a key loader, I can throw the, the encryption keys in it, and we could be talking. Now you have obviously you have narrow banded uh, FM. Yes. And you have Apco 25 digital Motorola. Yes. Do you have Moto Turbo? No. Okay. Uh, that is something you could look into. Some organizations, a lot of emergency communications groups are going Moto Turbo, but that's another thing. So okay, uh, when was the last time you guys were deployed? I think we went out uh, multiple arrest warrants on a fraud case probably three months ago. And uh, so how many people man this uh, trailer? I'd like to keep it as small as, few, as small as possible, but it takes a minimum of two. I think three is too many. So okay. I, I call it a two. Now I call this a trailer, but this is not a trailer. No, it's a unibody. It's, it's a, basically it's a 46,000 pound vehicle. Uh, so, you know, we have to kind of be careful what we set up, make sure that, uh, we have a good stable platform, good earth beneath us, because it'll it'll put holes right through a the bad concrete. Now you have a uh, at least one telescoping antenna up there. Yes. How do you know how high it goes? No, I don't. Okay. Do you, you have more than one telescoping? That I think has uh, six antennas on it, and then it's also got an array of uh, microwave antennas on it for downlinking from our helicopter. Okay, so how do you power this beast uh, during an extended deploy? For an extended deploy, um, I think the last time we did an extended deploy was for the RNC and the DNC in Ohio and Philadelphia. Um, we actually left this uh, unit here and I went to uh, man the one from Chicago. We drove that over to the DNC and the RNC. And basically we set up in a secure area. Uh, we were there for 17 days. Um, we were a fallback for uh, for the FBI and the Secret Service. So, but how are you powering this thing? With oh, the, it's, it's it's a diesel diesel generator. And do they deliver more diesel to you, or do you have to go drive and fill her up? Normally, before right before we actually land at our location, we'll top off the tanks. Uh, we ran seven days straight at the DNC without having to re refuel, and then uh, we were off to the RNC. Actually, the RNC first and then the DNC, so we never even had to refill at all. So how long do you think this would run without a refill? Oh, easily a week. And then it's also got the ability for shore power, and then we can put power out on the, on the grid too. Very good. Um, so is there any events that you intended to that you really remember the most? Yeah, but I don't want to get political. I, I, I'll definitely remember the DNC for a long time. Okay. Um, so, so does this uh, mobile facility, does this stay in a certain area of the United States? Yeah, this is it's a regional asset. It's uh, located in the city of Paramount. We have it in a store in a garage. But um, basically anything west of Dallas, we cover. So how many vehicles do they have? Can you even tell me how many we have? We have five. These, five, five of them. Five in the nation that are this big. Um, this is like the first generation. They've come out with a second generation. It's got some minor improvements on the chassis. Um, but as far as communication go and, and its abilities, it's all the same. Um, then we have, I think, three of the, this is called a dragon, so it's a big boy. We have three raptors, they're a little bit smaller, and uh, we can, those are, those are a lot more deployable. This one's, it's, you know, it, it takes a, a quite a bit to get it up and going, uh, but the raptors are just quick and go. They're, they're, so who drives this thing? I do. Okay. So. How do you get deployed? Who tells you that you need to deploy? Well, we have to we have to wait for if it's locally our SAC, our special agent in charge, he can deploy us um, at at any given time. So if we're doing like a local deployment with our within our own agency, um, you know, an agent will put up an ops plan and say, hey, we're going to arrest this many people. We'd like to have the mobile command center. It runs through management, runs up to the top, right back down. Now, if we were to deploy to another part of, that's not in our area of responsibility. So our area of responsibility goes from San Diego to San Luis Obispo out to Las Vegas. So if we were going to go help San Diego out, their office would request us to assist them. Then we'd go and deploy. Now, if we're going outside of our agency, they do an ESF-13 uh, requesting for federal assistance, and then we could deploy for that. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if you can answer this question, but can is this protected from EMP? No. Okay. So if we have a major earthquake in Southern California, do you have a pre-planned place you're going to go to, or how do you respond to that? We have uh, continuation operation plans, and so that, that's already been figured out where we're going to go. Um, the part of this this vehicle being stored here was um, was based upon us having the ability to put it in a place that is multiple freeway accesses um, in case when a freeway went down we have multiple ways of getting out um, so it's we're not we, we kind of thought all that out already and we have fallback places for this vehicle to where it goes should uh, you know, we, we need to uh, move it out and get, and get it someplace safe okay you know I want to thank you for your time I really want to thank you for your service you're and welcome be safe out there I will be thank you Ready, go. hi um, your name is? John Reynolds. And John, what organization are you from? Homeland Security Investigations. And what is Homeland Security Investigation? What do you do? We are part of the federal government. We are an agency oh. under the Department of Homeland Security. And we are criminal investigators. Uh, normally, uh, this is a collateral duty. This is an all volunteer team here. And by day, we investigate federal crime for Homeland Security. And as a supplemental part of our job, we uh, have formed and trained for this all disaster response team. And so how do you get deployed? I mean, what would happen? Who would tell you to deploy? It's multifaceted. Normally on the smaller level, we, through liaisoning and through training outreaches, we coordinate with a lot of the local uh, organizations in the area that we're from, because there are 18 of our teams around the country. We are just one of them. And we would, if, if, a, if a disaster happened in this area, through our communications and through our training environment, then we would be contacted by either that city government or that local law enforcement agency, and they would ask us if we're el or able to respond, whether it's in a law enforcement capacity or uh, what we focus on is a search and rescue capacity. So um, have you deployed recently? Yes. And could you tell us anything about that? Yes. Our most uh, recent deployment was with the San Bernardino terrorist attack. As part of Homeland Security Investigations, we were one of the primary agencies that were there on the scene assisting in the investigation. So we were deployed, first of all, is as federal law enforcement officers, is to help with the investigation. By the time we got there, the terrorists were deceased. So we fell back to one of our strong points in our, our team is to then set up a command post and then through the ICS system is run and handle the response to that incident. So do you travel alone? Do you travel with a communications truck? What, how do you travel? It, it depends. If it's, if it's in the continental United States, we would respond with that big white uh, mobile command center right there. Uh, we have several of those positioned throughout the, the uh, continental United States. So depending on what region is impacted, they would move the trucks around to then fill that gap. Now, uh, I come from a disaster communications organization. So I want to ask you a couple of questions about your communications. Mm -hmm. So do you use UHF radios, VHF radios uh, for your personal team? How do you communicate? Primarily, we use VHF. And are you digitally encrypted or are you in Yes, yes we are. Okay. Uh, now, when you go uh, working an event, do you pass your team communications through your communications trailer or do you go directly to an EOC? It would depend. Sometimes we do not go with the truck. In that case, we would go directly to the EOC. When we use the truck, we our communication would go right to the truck and then the truck would rebroadcast out. So on when you're not with your truck, yeah. how do you communicate with the EOC? With our radios, with our VHF radios. So do they have your frequencies or they don't hand out radios to you or? Because that it, can it, get pretty harrowing. It, I know it, how it goes. It literally depends. Uh, slowly we are being given radios that can transmit on both. So, but they're very expensive, budgets are limited, so those radios are slow in making it to the field, but yes. slowly and surely we are getting radios 
that can do both. Yes, uh, over the past few years, as you know, uh, the government has been pushing uh, interoperability among all the agencies around the country, it's, and that's very difficult. It's always an issue, and when you're dealing with the sheer number of agencies and the different means of communication, interoperability is always a problem. Okay. Well, you know, I want to thank you for your time, um, you know, and we want to thank you for your service. It can thank be you. a little bit dangerous out there, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. So, sure. again, thank you very much, and okay. please, you and your team, be safe. Great. Thank you very much.